I was at a party about a week before Sundance, and uh, a doc programmer son, was was pretty drunk, and uh, and I was pressing him for which docs. You know, I was like, I can't wait to see all these great docs you got at Sundance, and he just kind of was like, you know, holding himself up against a wall, uh, and he just said like this, "Come here, come here." I, I leaned closer, and he whispered in my ear, "Cartel Land." And so, if you haven't seen that movie, see it this weekend. The director is here to share a story with you. Welcome to the stage, Matthew Heineman. Come on up. Excuse me. True story. True story. I'm not a performer, so I'm gonna. I have some notes here. Hope that's okay. We're here by the fire. Hope you'll enjoy the uh, little story. Um. Cartelland is a film about vigilantism, uh, about vigilantes on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Each of these vigilante groups are fighting a common enemy, the, the violent and ruthless Mexican drug cartels. In the Mexican state of Michoacan, vigilantes known as Auto Defensas are fighting back after years of failure by the Mexican government to stop rape, murder, extortion, and gruesome violence at the hands of the Knights Templar cartel. The focus of my talk tonight will be on a scene that took place in Michoacan involving this storyline. Over the last half decade, this part of Mexico has been ruled by one cartel, the Knights Templar, an outgrowth of La Familia Michoacana. They announced their ascension to power in 2006 by tossing five severed heads onto a dance floor, accompanied by a note saying, quote, the family doesn't kill for money. It doesn't kill women. It doesn't kill innocent people. Only those who deserve to die know that this is divine justice. When they morphed into the, into the Knights Templar, Servander Gomez, known as Latuta, who you may have read about in recent days, who was captured, is a former school teacher who began running the operations for the cartel. The Templars pr profess to be protecting the people from government abuse, and they follow a pseudo-religious pseudo mantra. They're influenced by Catholic crusaders of the Middle Ages. Sometimes cartel members can even be found wearing white cloaks with red crosses. Under La Tuta, the Templars ruled with brutal terror over the people of Michoacan. In addition to the cartel's profitable meth trade, they made millions from illegal logging, selling black, black market iron ore to the Chinese, and through extortion from everyday tortilla makers to multinational corporations, and kidnapping or beheading anybody who got in their way. Having never, film, never filmed in dangerous areas before, I found myself in the middle of incredibly you know, dangerous situations, firefights between the vigilantes and the cartel, and many other precarious uh, places. But from the moment I stepped forth in Mexico, my goal was to shoot in a meth lab. And I knew I wanted to begin the film there. Meth was the main source of the Templars' power. It was their cash cow. It was their lifeblood. In fact, 90% of the meth consumed in the U.S. comes from uh, Michoacan from the Knights Templar cartel. We tried for months to get into a meth lab. Every shoot, I tried to find somebody who knew somebody, who knew somebody, who knew somebody, but it, we kept failing. We finally thought we had a guy who could hook it up, and he kept teasing us that he would deliver the goods, but to no avail. Finally, last summer, on one of our last shoots, it was one of those days when nothing was going right. Our, our, our car broke down, and in this really dangerous part of the mountains, and it just, you know, nothing went right. Then finally, the call came in. Be in the town square at 6 p.m. sharp, the voice on the, end of the other end of the phone said. I like shooting with a small crew, and at this point, it's just me, my fixer, and my translator. My fixer quickly established the ground rules with our meth contact. We would not be blindfolded, and in exchange, we promised not to show anybody's faces. And they required that we film them with, while they're wearing mas masks. 
We drove through, mount, through the mountains and made it to the town with a few minutes to spare. A pair of armed men asked us if we were ready and told us to follow them. With the sun dropping rapidly, they drove us down a highway, off the highway, through towns and small villages, which eventually gave way to vast open farmlands. Suddenly, in the middle of one of the fields, our guides stopped and told us that they weren't going any further. They would stay there to protect us. Protect us from whom, we wondered? From the vigilantes? From the government? From the federales? Another car drove out of nowhere and said that they would lead us into the meth lab. For months, I dreamed about how I wanted to shoot this scene. And the whole time I envisioned shooting it in the daytime or in, like a, in, a, in a trailer, trailer-like building. But when we got there, the last rays of light were falling beneath the mountains in the distance. The head chef, a small, fiery man, started showing us the lab. And that's when I realized that the lab wasn't the lab that I'd seen in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Instead, it was outside, hidden amidst a, amidst a dense forest of trees, and it was pitch black. That was a problem, since I don't shoot with lights, <laughs> nor would they have allowed me to use them. To keep us from tripping over the dense brush, the head chef, surrounded by big, burly men with assault rifles, used a flashlight to show us the way. And it was with this flashlight that I lit the scene. Over the course of two hours, I got a tour of the lab and the process of making meth. The big, burly men with assault rifles carried in containers of pure alcohol from a truck that soon arrived. Then, bar barrels of methanol were rolled in and mixed with crystal-looking substances. Eventually, all the ingredients were put into large blue barrels, and the big burly man with assault rifles stirred them with large sticks, as if they were some witch's concoction. As the barrels, as the barrels sizzled, and the smoke billowed in the air, and the cacophonous sound of cicadas rose and fell with an arrhythmic beat, and huge alien-like bugs crawled down our necks and inside our clothes, I talked to the head chef, and he told me, United States is where most of the drugs are sold, all over the United States. What can I say? We know we do harm with all the drugs that go there, but what are we going to do? We come from poverty. If we were doing well, we'd be like you, traveling the world or doing good, clean jobs like you guys. But if we start paying attention to our hearts, then we'll get screwed over. We'll do this as long as God allows it. As long as he allows it, we'll make drugs. And every day we'll make more. Because this is, not, this is not, a, not going to end, right? What do you guys think? He then turns around to the big Merley men with the assault rifles. And they say and refrain, I hope not. Of course not. The good stuff is about to begin. Around 11 p.m., my fixer told me that it was time to leave. And we were escorted out of the forest, into the fields, past the villages and the towns, and onto the highway. I was bummed, because I wanted to get more footage, more visuals to illustrate the process of making meth. So before we, before we left our new friends, we made a date to come back the following night. They told us we were welcome back any time. We were given instructions to be in a certain village at a certain time the next night, and we went and we waited. And we continued to wait, and they never showed up. Through a series of cryptic messages, we arranged to meet the next night, and again they blew us off. And the same thing happened the third night. Four days after our first visit, on our last day in Mexico, I turned to my fixture and I said, this is our chance. I think we should drive straight in since we have a vague idea where the meth lab is. It was a crazy idea. <laughs> but after consulting with various colleagues, we decided it was safe enough to try in the daytime. 
So we, bro- so we drove back through the towns and the villages and the fields, and soon the gnarly smell of meth started to penetrate our car, and we knew we were heading in the right direction. But suddenly, a car started, dri- a car started driving slowly at us, and our hearts started beating faster and faster. The three of us looked at each other and laughed, and probably made some morbid joke about how our bodies would soon be hanging from a bridge. The car drove up slowly next to us and rolled down their windows and asked, why are you here? And we replied, you know why we're here. They then told us to turn around and they escorted us out to the road. A second car drove up and rolled down their window and asked, why are you here? And again we replied, you know why we're here. After a few more interviews, we were told to drive down the road to a pool hall. Trucks that looked familiar and men that looked familiar came and went. Turns out, it was the place where the big burly men with assault rifles socialized. I struck up a conversation with one of the men and he began to spill the beans of how things really worked. I couldn't figure out whether I should bring out the camera. It was such an amazing scene to film and I was getting such good juice, but I also knew that we had worked so hard and risked so much to be there and that bringing out the camera might jeopardize our ability to get back into the lab or get us kicked out or perhaps something worse. It was killing me not to film because it was giving me such good info. But I stayed patient and eventually they gave us the green light to go back into the lab and to get the shots that I initially wanted. It was a good lesson because ultimately it allowed me to get the info that I needed to really understand the story that I was telling. And in fact, several weeks later, on our final shoot, I randomly ran into the man from the pool hall who had all the juice about what was happening and he agreed to be filmed. Ultimately, as I initially planned, I opened the film in the meth lab and then chose to bookend the film and and finish it there as well using this final tell-all interview. And as a mentor of mine in the film world once said, if you end up with the story you started with, then you weren't listening along the way. Thank you so much.